Welcome to Amazon Legends, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became power sellers. Also providers specializing in helping sellers, aggregators that acquire sellers, and former Amazonians will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here is your host, Nick Urison. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. My next guest today has been in e-commerce for a decade and a half. And finally, she decided to combine her knowledge of four languages and Amazon into her current company, YLT Translations. And this was five years ago. And she's the founder and CEO with a team of 82 people. So somewhere during the conversation, I'd like to share some of her experience about scaling her team. So we're going to talk Amazon, but this is also one of the challenges as you're building a company and you know, scaling the team and up to 82 people, I'm sure she's gone through a lot of um, curveballs in the process. So when she's not working, plays the piano and loves music and running. So with that, everybody meet my guest, Jana Krekic. Welcome to the show, Jana. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm really, really honored to be at your podcast uh, with among so many other great uh, hosts, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, <laughs> guests that you had, that you hosted. So I'm really excited about my topic today and hopefully I can uh, help people with some of my strategies they can implement and use in their business today. Sure. By the way, you were right when you said other hosts, because I have uh, some guests who have been hosts and yes. except <laughs> this time was on the other foot. So um, I am dying to hear about scaling to 82 people, uh, how one manages that. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I kind of faced that challenge myself. It's not easy. So uh, we'll get to it somewhere down the the, the, the show. But first, tell me something that you do very well right now. Uh, very well. We translate the listings into sales. This is what we do very, very well. So, and of course, your specialty is international marketplaces, right? It, so, Yes, correct. So not a listing optimization service, so to speak, to launch, but you are more for companies who are already mm -hmm. selling, but now they want to expand to international marketplaces. And that's where you come in with the language. Exactly, aspect. exactly. So what we really do well is we implement our strategy with tricks on international marketplaces. And we do that so that your brand sees um, profit when it comes to content keywords, absolutely everything. Uh, when it comes to written word of your brand and conveying the same message of your brand across different um, marketplaces and countries. Okay, and so, how do you do that? Tell us how you do that. So uh, content is very important. Content is still king. Uh, keywords as well, probably number one and number two uh, when it comes to um, the importance of um, what's going to sell your product. So definitely what we do is like we take the content that you have uh, in English. Let's say we mostly work with U.S. brands and we translate that into um, into new content that resonates with the target audience that conveys the right message using localization, not using direct like one-on-one -on -one, uh, translations but more like a rewriting doing a lot of keyword optimization doing keyword research for each marketplace separately so we can uh, like basically um include all of that and embed it into new content so it uh, does convey the same message of a brand but it resonates with the audience and has new keywords that are specific for that new marketplace uh especially because U.S. keywords and like U.S. style of like being salesy and fluffy, like having salesy and fluffy content doesn't work well, let's say with German audience. So you need to adjust it um, a little bit, sometimes a little bit more, uh, depending on the category and the product you sell so that the buyers want to buy your product. They find it compelling and also that it shows up in the search because you're going to use the keywords that are relevant for that marketplace especially and not just copying whatever is uh, presented on the u.s marketplace so you know one of the things that is essential <laughs> in, in, when you're launching in the u.s is first you go do your keyword research you identify your primary keywords 
your buying keywords, secondary keywords, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then you assemble the title, which is the most important. And then, you know, you move on to the rest of it, which the bullets and the A plus and the, and the descriptions and the back end and so on and so forth. So when you are launching in the, in an international marketplace, do, do you have to do all that from scratch based on what the local needs are? Or can you take what's already done and then translate it and kind of adjust? So I would advise the, 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 the first thing you mentioned. So that is doing it from scratch because even if you copy paste your English content from the US marketplace to the UK one, it's not necessarily true that all the key, all keywords are gonna be absolutely the same. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people know that like even within the, the, the US, like you're gonna have like different uh, choice of words, like different states, like a backpack versus book bag and, 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 and similar things. And just imagine like having a English spoken on different continents like the UK, where for instance, like we had one of the sellers was selling a diaper bag and then she copy pasted all the keywords everything she had from the us to uh, to sell it in the uk marketplace and actually um she wanted to be ranked for uh kids diapers i mean because of the diaper bag but in the uk the word diapers is used for adult diapers only so she was ranked for a completely different keyword she was spending money on their running ppc campaigns for a completely wrong search term um, and she just lost a lot of time and money so so uh, during the honeymoon period, you're definitely going to uh, get much more opportunity that you actually deserve. So um, Amazon understands like how well you rank for certain terms. And so she kind of, you know, like she, she was very, very relevant for sh what she should have been relevant for. And that did not do her any good. And just imagine just copy pasting the keywords and just having terrible results with that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that sometimes the words are going to be completely opposite meaning. It sometimes means that people are actually not looking for those uh, search terms. For instance, like in the US, maybe top search um, uh, terms are going to be gray travel mug, but maybe in the UK, it's going to be black travel mug. And then gray would not be not even like in top 100 search terms. And that's something like we've seen happens very often. And there are like so many um, examples with products that are really successful, let's say in Germany or in Europe and quite unsuccessful in the US. For instance, um, the case of wooden toys in Germany and throughout Europe, they're, they're, they're selling amazingly well and any sort of toys for kids or like toddlers, the category is amazing, doing amazingly well, much better than in the US. But especially wooden toys are doing much better than they're in the US, which has to do always with like um, just uh, uh, it's a cultural element, it's um, sustainability, much greater awareness of that in Europe, for instance, but like also like other parameters, like what we uh, found out also was that this portable AC will um, portable AC that you can like, you can use it like with batteries. Um, it's very popular in Germany. It's top 10 uh, search frequency terms in brand analytics. Whereas in the States, the it's like rated as 1,500 something um, search term frequency. So it's not in top selling product. And that is, there is like actually a, a very simple explanation to that. And that is because in Germany, uh, uh, the climate is changing, global warming is happening. And then summers tend to be hotter than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And um, most of the buildings and uh, houses in Germany, they do not have uh, central AC systems or any sort of ACs, ACs built into the buildings and houses. So people are like searching for other ways to cool off during uh, summers that are now 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, so basically over 100 Fahrenheit, which is really, really hot if you don't have an AC at your home. So they're looking to get like some portable and external products to cool off during the summer. And that is why this product is incredibly successful. Even though it's a seasonal product, you can make a lot of money selling that during uh, summer uh, summertime in uh, in Germany, definitely. And I mean, everybody knows that, you know, we know a lot of brands that do only seasonal products like Christmas presents or like Christmas 
business cards that they do incredibly well just with like the seasonal um, uh, branding and themes on their product. So I'm sure that a lot of uh, products that are like the AC could be found out there. Just if you look for like a long, long lines of like brand analytics and just see what the top search frequency terms are in um, five, six countries that you might uh, want to consider selling it, selling it. Yeah. So this almost tells me that you have to do product research almost before launching, because you may find that your product is not a good fit for a particular international marketplace. So is that the kind of situation that you see, or do you have, do you just take on the product no matter what, because there are search terms. So no matter what you're selling, there are enough search terms and it could be a niche. Or do you have you ever found yourself with a client where just product is not a good fit, or is it never the case? So um, mostly brands come to us and they say, "Look, we want to sell in one, two, five, six, seven countries," and then we, of course, do the the content, the, the keyword research, all of that. But lately, we've been asked uh, to help them understand if the product is going to be a right fit for. Uh, a new market, uh, which actually makes me really happy, Nick, because I think this is what a lot of brands uh, do wrong. They don't do any sort of due diligence. So they see that there are competitors or maybe they've heard that Germany is the biggest marketplace of the US. So they just want to go there, like uh, make it a quick win, like do like, uh, you know, increase the revenue, you know, make bigger profit. But it's not all fun and games. And it's not that simple that you just say like, okay, I'm going to go to Germany, do the VAT, all of that. And then just to understand that you've not made a lot of profit, that you basically just covered your expenses. And this is what happens a lot because brands in like bigger or smaller sellers, it doesn't really matter. They all do the same mistake and they just don't do any due diligence the right way. And due diligence is absolutely mandatory. And it's not that difficult because you just have to have a couple of steps. And if all of those steps have like, you know, green lights and every single step of that, that means that this is the marketplace that you should consider expanding to, but not before you see like the, the revenue, the product is making sales, how fierce the competitors are, um, you know, if there is some space for you to like maybe be ranked from some of the key keywords that your competitors aren't aren't uh, using, which is quite often uh, the case in different uh, non-English marketplaces. And the reason to that is very simple because these U.S. brands and you know enterprise levels or like small sellers, they don't usually speak the target language, so they don't consider content as important. Unfortunately, um, content should be equally important across all uh, different marketplaces because, you know, keywords are the way how to find out your product, uh, how consumers find your product. But a lot of cases, what happens like when, when we do like an audit or like give feedbacks on some listings that are underperforming is that content doesn't make much sense on any of these listings. And literally, I would say 5% or less have integrated uh, keywords that make sense. So nobody has done any actual keyword research. So this is what we've seen that ha that happens very, very often. It is a mistake that you can easily uh, prevent uh, from happening and you can just really maximize on that honeymoon period to get ranked on something that you, it's really relevant for your product and for something that could really help you later um, increase your brand awareness and like, you know, bring more products to the uh, to that marketplace. But as I said, Due diligence is essential, and it's really not that difficult uh, to, to feel the pulse of the new marketplace, but you really have to feel the pulse um, uh, if you want it like, to keep on beating faster after that. And what I also think was important, uh, we also had sellers that would come to us and say like, Listen, so like we have this listing done, like, you know, by somebody who knows Amazon, keywords are done, everything was seen as perfect pictures, all of that, but the product is just not selling. And that was a very interesting case for me when we first got it a couple of years ago. So I went to my German team and I asked them like, listen, so this, the seller, he's like really, you know, he's really frustrated, was frustrated because this product is not selling. He did everything by the book. Was, is, is there any feedback I can get from you guys? In every single one of them, I have 14 uh, people on my German team. They said, you know what, Jana, like this is not a product for a German marketplace. It's not something that 
we would buy and it doesn't resonate well with the German audience. And that product were two t-shirts with like Mr. and Mrs. t-shirts with like some funny drawings on them and, and everybody hated it. And they're just like, you know what? This is just not gonna, not gonna work. And then it was like, hmm, see, like audience is very important. So I think that also before you start selling product, especially if you wanna go to uh, Japan, which is like a really completely different marketplace than anything else like um, Europe and US, like they're pretty much aligned. Like a lot of things will work if they work in the States, but for Japan, you can never know. Like you have to ask the, the 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 consumers in Japan, is this something that they would buy, and is this something that they would think it's weird or not? You know, because it's different mentality and it's just quite quite different market than anything else um, on uh, global Amazon marketplaces. So what I think could be a really good idea is for sellers just to go to um, Facebook expat groups and just ask them like, hey, I need a sample of Italian audience or like French or whichever other nation, just ask them like, do you buy on Amazon? And would you think, would you buy this product? Or you can just ask, would you or somebody you know consider buying this product? Because then not necessarily, maybe, you know, these, uh, the, the audience they ask, maybe they don't like to go skiing and you're selling ski, ski equipment, but they have neighbors and friends that love skiing and they would love to buy your winter ski jacket or your accessories or your crazy scarf or something like that. So I think that um, asking the target audience would be something very, very relevant because as I said, and as I, you know, um, I showed the example of, you know, having everything done perfectly good, but the product is just not selling because the audience really did not get it. Um, so I think that's uh, one of the very important steps, which I think, sellers and brands never think it's it's relevant but sometimes that can kill your product so yana tell me how do you do that research i mean it's a it would be nice to have like focus groups and things like that but that's obviously beyond reach so what is it can you share with us some practical ways to get a sense of whether or not a product is a good fit for a particular marketplace Right, so we like to use Helium 10, and then uh, we just go to um, Helium 10, you do the magnet uh, keyword research, which is basically you search for the main keyword, you change the flag to whichever country you need, and you just uh, dig in a little bit. You can use Google Translate, you just can understand what's that word that you're searching for, that you use that word into amazon.de, for instance, if you're doing the German research. And you see if this is the product that shows up, because sometimes if you use Google Translate, you're not going to get the exact product that Amazon is selling for that same word. So you need to double check that you are actually searching for the, the valid product. And then you just uh, go back to Helium 10, do the magnet research, see the search volume. If there is a search volume of 100,000, if that's the search volume for the exact product, it means that people are looking for that product. I see. Okay, so the, going back to the example of T-shirt with Mr. and Mrs. So would that would, I guess you would search that term, Mr. and Mrs. T-shirt, and then if there is no search, or similar so that's that's the way you are talking about going about it right yes exactly i would search for either that specific product or something similar and try to understand if this is um something that is being sold maybe there's not going to be mr and mrs but if they're going to be matching shirts with girlfriend boyfriend or as a couple and that would work well then i'm sure that your mr and mrs would work but in this case it didn't like we didn't find anything similar to that and that was a very good um uh, that was a good sign for us to understand that this is something that would need to be changed a lot in order to be sold in Germany. So you'd have to change the couple t-shirts to something else which had nothing to do with couples. Okay, so, you know, this brings us to a, a, an interesting question because as you know, when you're launching something new, you've got a great idea, it's unique and you come up with this idea and then you've done your research and and there's nobody doing it. So you say, okay, we're gonna be the first mover in this space yeah. and nobody else is doing it, so it's a great thing. But what you are saying is that's not really the case in some cases because you want competition because 
So yes. That's the other side of it, right? So if there is nobody doing it, there is probably a good reason why <laughs> nobody is doing it. I agree. Right? I agree. I would say that if you sell a new product and you don't have any competitors on that marketplace, I would think twice before you launch it. Me personally, I would not recommend doing there unless you've done some extended, amazing due diligence and research on it. So they are 100% sure that this product is going to make it. But from my experience, if you don't have any competitors, stay away from that marketplace. Okay. That's a, that's a very valuable thing to to hear really especially in the amazon space because the alternative is you go do all the research spend all the money and the time and send inventory and then they get all the regulatory stuff with vats and everything and then only to find out that this actually has no demand so okay so really i mean we've been talking now uh, about 20 minutes and what i picked up from you is two things really before you do anything first you have to do your research as if you are going to launch the product for the first time or you're going to launch a product for the first time to see if your product is a good fit for that marketplace you do your research you measure the demand before even keyword to see product is a good fit then you simply go back to the drawing board as if you don't have a listing as you would have in the US with all the content that you start from scratch because it's totally different language. I mean, it is not even different version of the English language. It's a completely different language, right? So, yeah. so yes. uh, and that language, so taking your keywords and then just translating them and then trying to figure that's not the way to do it. So you have to build it from scratch with the, with the right kind of search terms that have demand and that will describe and then touch those emotional points that the correct shoppers correct yes okay. because consumers consumers will look for different things and just um, think of this as having you know you went to university and your college roommate was german was he the same guy as you were like you know like with the mentality was it the same did you guys enjoy same things I don't think so. You know, it was quite different. And Germans were very much like straightforward or like, you know, black and black or white. It, well, Americans are like salesy and fluffy. And let me tell you this story. And like, you know, let me just sweet talk and sugarcoat everything for you. So just like think of that when you think of, you know, presenting your products to a different audience. They're not going to search for same things as you are. They're going to have different search terms because they will have different preferences. So just bear that in mind when you are uh, building a new listing that you want to um, to sell in a different country to a different mentality and different culture than yours. Yeah. So there is a great saying that I and anybody listening to my, my episodes, I'm sure they've heard it that uh, when you have a new idea and you're looking to launch a business, it goes, think global, but act local. So yes. that's exactly what you are talking about, right? So you may have a product that may have a global appeal, but when you are launching it in a particular marketplace, you have to act completely local and then localize. Yes. Okay. So, so we've covered the keywords aspect of it. How about uh, the pictures? Uh, do, is there a different approach to the pictures and the videos? So um, uh, I think that throughout these four, four and a half years, we've worked with, I think, more than 4,000 brands. And uh, some of these brands, I would say three, four percent, they would ask, so like, do you need me to localize the images? Like, what's the rule of thumb? And then even if I would recommend, like, I think you need to like have different models or uh, maybe you need to like use different colors. Zero uh, percent changed any of the images in any of the videos. So there is like literally zero brands that I know of that actually implemented localization when it comes to their images and videos, they all kept the same um, A plus content, main images, 
but they did change the language on those uh, images. Um, earlier, it was not possible to change uh, language on main images. Now that's possible as well. And then A plus content also, of course, like uh, it's better to have, um, let's say, uh, Japanese or German instruction or slogan of your company or whatever, like written in their target language because um, according to Harvard Business Review, I think it's only 15% uh, of the whole uh, population, like human population that speaks English. So if you sell like in non-English marketplaces, um, you'll be basically targeting every second or third consumer instead of like every single person. So my strongest recommendation and what I've seen that, that brands do, not all of them, but I think more and more nowadays is that they change the wording on their images. And if you have uh, videos, they just use subtitles in the target um, language, or if they have some words showing up in the videos, they change that those two. And that does make an impact. And we've recently had a case study with one of the sellers. Uh, it was done uh, in January. So it was like two, three weeks, I think, of uh, uh, A-B testing. And then it showed 39% um, in conversion rate because it was changed from English to German wording. They were having uh, German text um, um, for German marketplace. And it was 62% increase in profit because of that. That was the only thing they changed. It was an A-plus images because it showed how to unzip uh, the, this was like this like kid's uh, toddler's fleece jacket because it had like a really cool way how to like zip and unzip it. And, uh, and it, was, it would not have been clear had they left this in English, but it was very nicely explained in German. So people, I think that they liked it because I think, you know, uh, that if people do not understand your product 100%, they are highly unlikely going to buy it especially when it comes to supplements, beauty products, anything that has any sort of ingredients or it's complicated to assembly. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. So you're, you're, you are saying that your images can stay the same, but any, yeah. any uh, text on those images, you need to translate them into the local language. I mean, that only makes sense. And, but yes. I'm I'm uh, all, kind of surprised to hear that you keep the same image rather than come up with a different image. So that's a good thing. Obviously, that's that's an easier thing to to do. It's the and easiest also, thing to do. I think brands are like, oh, this is just too much work. Let's just keep it the same, but let's change the wording on the image. And this is what everybody did. I honestly do not know a single brand who use completely different images, completely different uh, models, colors, like everything. They just kind of stick to what they already had. And just like the text really helped the, the increase in, in conversions, like impressions, like something did happen after they've uh, implemented that. Yeah. And the other very valuable point you made is videos. Videos can stay in English, but make subtitles in the local language. Yes, especially because, um, you know, it's Amazon, like you, you might just kind of browse the products like where you're like on a public transport or just like somewhere else where you cannot hear it. So it doesn't really matter what language it speaks, but like subtitles, this is like what everyone can uh, can read at any time. So they can play this and then the subtitles can go like in English. And I know a lot of brands that have English, uh, let's say they have like the the, the the user reviews videos on their product, but they always put English subtitles, even though it's like an English video, because it's very easy to, to read it and like not to focus on like hearing it. So um, it doesn't really matter which language it's, the audio is in what's important are the subtitles yes I, the, you, this is another interesting point it's true these days i mean you you have to have videos so people want videos yeah. and as yet every video has subtitles because when people are watching those videos they don't have the sound on they have the sound exactly off. or it's too loud so they cannot hear whatever the case i mean i do it myself I'd rather watch Same. a video but read the subtitles 
because I'm busy doing other things and I don't want the sound. It becomes too- exactly. And then now you have all those like engaging captions, like with different colors, little emojis that keep you engaged. Not the audio or like how this like person's narrative is, but exactly how the visually it looks like on your phone. Because I think nowadays after like TikTok and YouTube Shorts, it's all about how it visually looks. Is it appealing? Is it like attention grabbing in the first couple of seconds? And I think this is where the subtitles really uh, play a big role. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, as I talk to you, I'm seeing like there's so many layers of this thing. So you have yeah. what you just mentioned on, on the subtitles, you can use emojis, you can underline it, you can bold it. So that's almost like the video is talking to you without sound, except through exactly. the subtitles. Yeah, exactly. Very valuable, uh, a very valuable tip. I will take these tips straight to the bank. I'm not telling you, this is, this is so valuable. Uh, okay, on A+, you made the point about 39% uh, increase in conversion. So uh, A+, plus is there is a lot of text in A+, plus, but the, that text is not always necessarily in in text format it's in pictures yeah so, pictures with text uh, like on it yeah. yeah yeah so you need to localize them as well yeah but that should not be a problem like whoever is doing that for you you just need to give them your raw images and then they could use the same font it's really it, it, it will look like it's the original text just in another language yeah. uh what also one one uh, important thing that i wanted to mention are um, uh, shoppable images on your brand store. They're available in Europe too. I don't see brand stores using them that often, but I think it's also very much engaging with the audience. And then also if they're like in the target language, it's very, you know, it's clickable, it's viable. So, and also visually appealing. So I would always, um, uh, I would always love to to encourage brands use the shoppable images on their brand stores um, on Amazon storefront. Okay, so let, let's explain to the listeners what the shoppable images uh, are and and how do you how do you actually create them and and put them all together. So shoppable images, uh, th those are something that you use on your um, Amazon storefront, like as a part of your brand store. And um, you can use it because I like it because it's it can be like a very big picture. So let's say that you're selling uh, bedding duvets or like pillow covers or uh, something like similar products like from your from your same uh, collection or brand. And then uh, you can like uh, create a picture of let's say someone laying on that bed and you can put like a couple of dots on each of the product that you're selling from that picture. For instance, are you selling the, the pillow co cover? Are you selling the, the duvet cover? Are you selling the actual pillow? Just gonna put like a little dot in it. And then when people like like uh, go like with the the, the house, mouse uh, arrow across them, the, these products will show up. So it's like a really nice uh, way to present all of the collection and what your brand is selling. And this is like really, um, uh, it's really uh, simple to set it up. Uh, basically you um, add a new section to a page in Amazon stores. Um, you choose the shoppable image tile type. Um, the shoppable image can be its own full wide section or in the layout with large and medium sized tile options, depending on what you want. Then you upload an image or add one from the asset library. You can crop it if you need it. You can just kind of make it, you know, you can customize it as much as you want. And then you can place up to six products interaction points on the image and link to products through the um, editing screen. And you just uh, save and submit and then you publish it that way. And I think it's a perfect uh, preview of like what your brand is offering. And and this takes place on the store, Amazon storefront, Yes, right? brand store. Yeah, storefront, it's your brand store. It's like presenting who your brand is. You know, it's like basically having a little Shopify store, uh, but you're having your brand store on um, Amazon. But I think it's really nice because you can have a better overview of what you're selling instead of having people to click and scroll and this and that category and like the pillows and the duvets, you have the whole picture. And then also people can visualize how these things look all at the same time. You know, like maybe they don't like your pillows, but they love the duvets and they would not 
not be scrolling for the duvets after they saw your pillows. But now they can see them all at once in this like big picture, which is like basically your brand portfolio. And they, they can, uh, they can uh, decide they want to click and see more and research more about it. Yeah. And, and the other thing that that would drive traffic to your Amazon storefront is linking your listing from your A plus page back to your storefront with a yes. with a link. So that way it kind of becomes you create your own ecosystem. So people yeah. do a search and then your listing comes up. If you've done a good job with your content, your PPC, and they click on the listing, they come to the product page. On the product page, they have your you have your A plus content. From your A plus content, you link it back to your Amazon storefront. And then now on the Amazon storefront, you have the shoppable images of different products. And they could you could really capture the the shopper, you know, in a way that that you are showing them, you're sh showcasing, so to speak, some of the products that exactly. you want to sell. Showcasing, that's the word. <laughs> Showcase yeah. everything yeah. you have. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the 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 measuring of the performance, so to speak. So when you launch in an international marketplace, tell us about what you are measuring to see if it's a successful launch or what are some areas for improvement. So I just think that you have to do a lot of A-B testing. Uh, when it comes to content, what we do, uh, you can definitely measure like uh, the title, the bullets, you can measure um, product description, uh, A-plus images. There's like a lot of things that you can uh, change, of course, one variable at a time, never change two, three, or more at the same time because you would not know what uh, what is working. But I would definitely suggest to do A-B testing, leave it for like two, three weeks, and then um, see how like how the parameters have changed like for worse or for better, and then just like follow that new strategy. But I just think um, the, the whole uh, year, like well, Q4s, like year after year should definitely be um, uh, everything is measurable, right? That's why we love data. So I just think you should just compare a lot and do a lot of A-B testing and that way understand what works better for your business, what not. Because maybe something that works there for a competitor would not work for you because you don't know what else they have been doing. You know, like when people say like, we just changed keywords in the title. Um, and you're like, I changed the keywords and title and it didn't work well for me. And I'm sure the other competitors will not tell you what they're actually been doing as well in their backend or, um, you know, change in inventory, whatever, you know, like it's just like, so many things um, to pay attention to and to follow. But I always suggest that when it comes to content, uh, what is definitely the biggest uh, thing for your listing is going to be the title and the first two or three bullets and the images. And I would constantly test uh, those. Uh, for images, of course, like you can use um, services like PicFu where you can uh, um, ask the audience, like, you know, what did they like better, like picture A or B, uh, different backgrounds, different improvements, and then change that uh, over a certain uh, amount of time. Because I think the brands that know what they're doing, they would optimize their whole list things every six, seven months or so, just to double check like that they're like on schedule and always like new things uh, pop up, there are like new regulations, uh, there are new rules, uh, you know, it's very, uh, the, the space changes a, a, a lot of times, so you have to like keep up to date with everything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's key to test and what you said is, is so important. Do not change too many things at the same time. So people yeah. say that, oh, you know, why, why do things too long? when you're launching stuff? Well, it's very simple. First of all, you have no historical data. You're starting from scratch, number one. Number two, you have so many things that you would want to try to see what is working best. But in order to try those things, you need to try one thing at a time for a, a substantial amount of time so that you collect enough data. So rather than do it for a few days and then 
move on and then do something else or change three things and then give it a week. It doesn't work that way. So you have to change one thing and then give it two, three weeks and then change another thing, give it two, three weeks and then compare the data and then keep going. So this takes, so before you know it, one single listing could take you six months before yeah. you know what's working and what kind of performance it's getting. And and then it's time to change everything again because it gets old, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, brands are not that consistent. Uh, also, like I don't think a lot of them keep up with the uh, with the mandatory maintenance. Like they just uh, set it and forget it, as it happens a, a lot of yeah. time. Uh, but uh, ideally, I think also when it comes to content and keywords, you should refresh and make sure that your content is up to date every six months, just like to make sure that you're still, you know, ranking for the relevant terms that nothing new uh, popped up, you know, maybe you want to refresh it for seasonal keywords, like, you know, depending on what you're selling, like Mother's Day um, keywords or, you know, Christmas or any of the 4th of July holidays or anything like it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And those special days, you know, if you, you may benefit from adding some elements to your images and so that way people connect more. So this is uh, extremely valuable. So Yana, I want to hear from you about scaling your team. So give us, how do you, and for those who are watching, they can see Yana. And uh, those who are listening, you can, but you better check the video. You think that she's like uh, some senior person and she's like a, a, a young lady. And, and this lady has built this company to 82 people. So tell us, what is your secret to do it successfully? So I don't think it's a secret. I just think it's uh, ability to learn how to delegate. This is, that was something which was the most difficult thing for me to learn. But after I've um, I've learned how to do it, this is when things started happening for me, and this is when my team uh, scaled. Uh, the first year it was like me and three freelancers basically, and I was doing everything. I was doing twenty hours a day, and and I was working nonstop for the first year and a half. And then I just wanted to go on vacation, and then I was packing my laptop and. My husband said, like, wait, wait, what, what are you doing? Like, we're going on vacation. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm going to work on vacation. And he goes like, no, 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 like, you're not going to work on vacation. And then uh, what happened is that there was, like, actually no Wi-Fi there. So I had to delegate it unwillingly to uh, uh, my ex-coworker who took care of the things. And I didn't sleep for five days. I thought, you know, everything is ruined. Like, I don't have a company anymore because I am a freak control. And I didn't really like that. What that It was, like, really out of my hand but then when I came back from the vacation um nothing happened everything was okay there were like they were like minor screw-ups but nothing too important that could ruin everything I was building and after that I just realized you know what I need to have some time off and I need to delegate because I know I know that there, there's no one that will be as good as me and what I do but if, if things get done if we have we get project delivered to clients we get paid that is good enough for me. And then at the, from that point, I started delegating more and more. I built our SOPs. Uh, we have our knowledge base where we have absolutely everything, all questions and answers in form of videos. So we basically covered everything that anyone could talk, ask me. I've made those videos by myself. It took me a while, but they're still legit even today, like two years later. And then whoever has a question looks at the knowledge base first and then comes to some of our project managers or COO, not before that. So like, I, I think the building procedures and delegating and just kind of making it, um, making your company uh, and the whole procedures, I like to call it idiot proof, which means that even the stupidest question kind of gets answered inside of that procedures and like the videos and everything you built. This is something that you want to strive to do because you want to put your business on autopilot and then you want to focus on your business and not working in your business because you don't want to be um, just uh, prison into um, operational work. You want to be building uh, your business bigger and greater and like focusing your time on what's relevant. Now, what I do is that I put on paper how much uh, money I make, my, my company makes during month. 
And then I say like, okay, my, my one hour of my time is worth this much then. And then if there's something for me to do operationally in the business sometimes, or maybe take a phone call or jump on an irrelevant meeting, I would say like, is this call or something I need to do operationally? Is it worth my time? Because let's say my hour is worth, I don't know, let's say $700. And I'm like, is this worth $700 for me to do? And then often it's like, no, it's not. It's a waste of my time. And then I say, like, help, I delegate it to somebody else who works for me. And then I use that hour for something that is going to be more relevant to our company and to the employees that work with us. Well, so I'm going to summarize the things that you mentioned that are so, it's like gold to me because this comes natural to you. You don't really realize the value of. The, the, the things that you are sharing with the audience. First of all, the first thing you said was ability to delegate. So it's two different things, right? So it's delegating and then your ability to delegate because there are a <laughs> lot of people, yes. they jump, they, they jump. And I, I, have, I have clients like that. Like I purposely, when I work with my clients, I say, okay, who am I going to work with? And the owner says, me. I said, no, sorry, that's not acceptable. Because the owners are never available. And there's often a lot of homework. They don't do their homework, constant excuses. So this is not serious. So uh, some people do delegate, but they don't want to. And they just jump themselves. So first, is it, uh, you know, there's the word coachable. Are you coachable? So some people are not coachable. They know what to do. They, they can do it, but they just won't because that's not who they are. They just like to do the things themselves. So ability to delegate. Uh, and so if you don't have the ability to gain it, if you don't know how to delegate, you have to learn it. So share with us a little bit, how do you delegate? And then how do you check back what you delegated has been done? So what's your process for that? Um, so now uh, I have a C-level management, so I don't check in a lot. I have my COO who does that for me. Uh, so she, she would, for instance, tell me, hey, so we've delegated, like she has personally delegated this to a project manager or somebody else on the team. And then uh, she, get back, she gets back to me saying, hey, so this is, it went this, this, is this, this are the results. Uh, that this did not go well, this went well, blah, blah. So she basically, we have a call once a week uh, where I keep up with uh, most of things uh, that, are, that are relevant to me. And then she tells me like, okay, so remember this client, it was very important. We did this, we did this, this didn't go well, this went well. So she kind of summarizes everything for me so that, that she keeps me in the loop that way. There's absolutely no way that I can keep track of absolutely everything uh, going on in the company because we do a lot of projects. Those are probably two, 3,000 products every month, sometimes even more. And then there's absolutely no way for me to keep track on every single project. But that's why I have my COO in place. And see, she's probably the most organized and hardest working person I know. And what I like to do is like, I like to hire people that are smarter, smarter and better than me in some of different things. Like I suck at numbers. Like I really do not don't know how to do p &L, but I have a really good CFO and she tells me like, no, 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 this is not great. And she corrects me and she sends all the good things at me personally. I'm really not great at, at uh, giving quotes. I would probably not even break even. And I don't think I was doing a great job at the beginning because I was covering all of that at the beginning of uh, business like four and a half years ago. But now when I give a quote to someone like talking at a conference or somewhere else, then my CEO Luna comes to me and she's like, what the hell did you do? Like, we're not even breaking even with this product. And I'm like, oh my God, really? And then I'm like, Okay, I'm putting you on it just like, you know, you know, hop on a call and just negotiate something better. And she comes back and she tells me like, we're good. And, you know, I mean, people, they, you, you cannot be good at everything. And I don't, and I think it's a really good thing to admit what you're not good at and then hire someone who's better at it than you. And that's like, you have to think overall, like what's better for my business. You like, 
Amazon space and e-commerce space is uh, like a like a, a game of egos and very big, um, yeah, very big egos in the game. And people really get upset when they have to admit that they're wrong or they're not good at something. But I think that you should turn that into your strength because uh, I would have never scaled my company this big had I like was try- had I tried to keep on top of absolutely everything, which is impossible. And because when you realize that you have some free time on your hands, that free time in your life offline for one or two days a week really has no price. Your mental health, your time with your family, with your partner, with your kids, like that is something that you should nurture apart from your business. And if you can delegate all of the relevant things in something that are like really not important for your time, you should do it and you should outsource that to smarter people than you are. And of course, I've had a lot of problems and really bad hires and I've had a lot of bad experiences but eventually I could count on a couple of people from my company that I know that they will keep on top of uh, things that will not let things uh, fall apart. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, it's so true that you have to hire people better than you and leverage their strength into the strength of the company. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, it's, uh, you're spreading yourself too thin. You have no life. Yes. Frankly, you're not yes. even good at it. So why are you doing it? So you wouldn't actually yeah. hire yourself for some of the jobs you are doing, right? So <laughs> Yes. No, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> the only reason why I was doing that is that, as I said, like I couldn't afford anybody else. And also I was a control freak that would not exactly. let go and everything because yeah. I would think everything will start falling apart, which is absolutely not true. You know, whatever you're thinking it's not that bad. And whenever you think like, oh my God, this is the end of the world, it's not, you know? Yeah. And it's always better than how you, um, how you experience it when you think it's gonna happen. So I'm sure that um, a lot of things are only in our minds because it's hard for us to let it go, especially if, if you have been building something from scratch and you know it's yours it's your little baby and so they're like no everybody's gonna ruin it but you have to understand that you have to sacrifice something in order to scale that baby and to scale your team above 10 uh, team members which is very often a bottleneck for a lot of teams and for a lot of companies Um, and you have to go outside of your comfort zone and you know what like every time when I feel like oh my god this is terrible at giving me anxiety I just go and do it or I let somebody else handle it I'm like this is not a good idea if I you know say yes to this project and then we say yes and I'm like you know, I'm scared what's going to happen and some good things come out of it. Because I think that there's actually no growth if, if you're not outside of your comfort zone sometimes. If you're staying in your comfort zone, then you're going to have like a an agency or a brand with three products, you're going to do average, but you're never going to do anything amazing. So if you want to do average and if you want to do, you know, great job that's cool, then you can just like stay where you are. But if you want to do something amazing, then you should go out there and like, you know, put yourself in uncomfortable shoes and figure it out, honestly. And I was, I'm not someone that's, you know, that has dreamt of like having their own company when I was a teenager or like not even when after my university or, you know, when I started this company when I was um, 33 and uh, I had no entrepreneurial aspirations before that but now at this point I would never go back and work for anybody else and I would just kind of try to build more businesses you know try out other things and this was not who I was like mentally I was not ready for any any of this I was not a public speaker I was not great at talking about what we do I would never hop on a podcast and be like why would they even want to you know talk to me in a podcast like who would even use our services to the point where I can go on a very big stage and talk to you in front of uh, hundreds of people and just to be sure that when we do something, it's really good. We work with a bunch of enterprises. So everything is about how much you're willing to push yourself and um, the, the persistence. Like that's two most important things. So this is actually a good segue to what we want to know about you. So tell us about yourself. So uh, take us back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? 
So I'm born and raised in Belgrade in Serbia. That's a small country in Southeast Europe. Um, and uh, it's not a amazingly um, well e-commerce, let's say, environment over there. Um, so it's not an actually fantastic environment to grow in and to be, um, uh, to, to try to understand that there's something for you outside of nine to five office jobs, basically. Um, well, my, my parents. Before, before the nine to five job, nine to five job. I mean, yeah. Growing up. I want to know about your experience growing up because clearly today you are a, a business person. You with a lot of responsibilities, a lot of risk taking. Yeah. So making money, leading people. I want to know, when did you realize growing up as a kid that these things that were things that you were doing, that you wanted to do? So as a kid, I've always had a lot of responsibilities and I really, really enjoy that. So ever since I was five years old, I would go to a British kindergarten in the morning till like noon. And then after that, I would go to musical kindergarten. In my whole life, I've been going to like parallel schools, uh, high schools, and I would just basically just, you know, be... Like I will be out there and learn, like I would be learning constantly for like 12 hours a day. But then after that, I would love to go out and hang out with my friends. And I was always someone who had a lot of energy. Um, I was never into sports. I was always more into like books and music and, uh, and uh, instruments and concerts. Um, never into sports, uh, but I was always trying to educate myself and learn more. I was always in love with languages and, and music and a bunch of things. And then one of the things that I thought I was very good at at a very early age was actually doing a lot of things uh, for a short amount of time. So I was very well organized. And I think that kind of really um, uh, it really formatted me into how I am now, because I think I'm very well organized when it comes to business, when it comes to procedures, I have a lot of responsibility. That's why I kind of grew into be a, a control, control freak. Cause you know, like when you have a lot of responsibilities, you kind of really want to make sure that you've done every single one of them, but it all actually helped me a lot with a lot of, uh, to deal with a lot of things at the same time and to just kind of really, um, really do my best at whatever I do. I never wanted to do anything like superficially or just kind of like just do it, you know, for the sake of being done. I always wanted to go more like in depth and in details and just kind of uh, get to the bottom of it. Uh, but I learned how to do it very quickly. And also like, you know, the way I speak, I speak like very, very fast. I think it's also connected like with one another. And then, um, so as a kid, I was like very, uh, very uh, organized and I was very hardworking and I really liked that like my parents they did not push me into anything it was all my idea like I even went to like figure ice skating I always wanted to have like a bunch of things to do like uh, during the day and I think it shaped me a lot into who I am um, today and I would just like to thank my parents for for su always supporting me to like you know whatever I wanted to do they were just like go do it you know they were like very very supportive um, so, um, but I never had any like um, entrepreneurial uh, mindset at all. Like I, I, I wanted to work for a corporation when I grow up and I didn't know at one point what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so I, at the end, I decided to go and study uh, languages and literature because that's what I was good at. Uh, and, uh, and after that, shortly, I got a job uh, in one of the leading e-commerces in Europe. Um, as a call center representative, which is not a, a dream job of mine, but I was, I was, you know, up for a challenge and I, I took it and it was a customer service representative uh, in, and we spoke Danish and I had a fake name. My, my name was Heidi Larson. I still have it as a Wi-Fi passport in my apartment. Um, and then uh, after that, I just learned a lot about e-commerce. I was 22 and uh, at the end, I was a COO of the, the, the company that had 400 employees and I learned a lot about e-commerce, how to build everything from scratch. I went to like all the different departments and um, I, that's also when I first heard the words uh, buy box. That was like 12 years ago. I was also running some of the Amazon accounts that I was really interested in. And then uh, after eight years of the company, I decided to quit my job. 
because my boss was an asshole, uh, to put it nicely. And uh, that's, that's what it pushed me into thinking that I deserve better. And then if I can do so many good things for somebody else, why, why don't I do something like that for myself and get all the appraisal and um, money and everything that goes with it uh, for myself and not to give it to um, anybody else. And that's how I started YLT, um, uh, among other things. I always have like a side hustles, but yeah. yeah. I want to go back to the beginning. So I heard you say that I always had a lot of responsibilities. As a kid, I understand liking books more than sports, but I don't understand the responsibility part because no kid just goes grab responsibility. It it was given to you. So somebody gave you those responsibilities and then you took it and took it and took it. So do you remember how you ended up having so many responsibilities? Because um, I thought that like when, once you like fulfill the responsibility, it's it's like very it was it felt like an award. It was a very awarding uh, experience for me. Like for instance, like uh, I would like go to my musical kindergarten, and then the teacher would say like This is your homework, and you need to practice." And then I would go home, and I would do my homework and practice on my own. Like my parents would never check up on me. Like if I did my homework or if I went to the store and bought like this new musical book and you know, like I was always ready and prepared, but I was not like too nerdy. I really, really enjoyed it. And then the more tasks someone would give me, I would uh, accept it as a challenge to like take him off the list. And then once I was able to do it, I felt really happy and good about myself. And this is how it was like from my er, like early age till I was like on my university. I kind of got worse at <laughs> university. I was not that responsible, but I think like the first, um, I'd say I, from like age four till like I was 19 and 20, I was like really like everybody would know that I'm responsible. And then if someone tells me something or people would count on me, then I would show up. I will do things I said I would do. I I will uh, fulfill all my duties. Like also at at home, I will have my mom. And that that would always kind of feel so nice to me. It would not be just like a, it would not put, it would put me through a lot through stress, but I kind of enjoyed it. You know, it was like the, the stress and uh, the challenge and everything that was like very exciting for me. So it was like every time that I would like reach a goal or milestone or like did something better than the previous time, I would be like, wow, like I, I'm doing something really good. Like I'm proud of myself. And I was just really enjoying the whole ride, even though those those things would be as small as like, you know, like clean your monitor or I don't know, wash your hair every three days or something like that. You know, like it would be very, very, important for me and then I would make sure that I stick to that schedule and then I need to be also very punctual uh, in order to feel a lot lot of things so there were like a lot of skills that I actually developed at that age and and that I kept it till this day and I think that way of life really really helped me into organizing my business the way it is today so would you say that when you are when you take on a responsibility and then you're supposed to deliver something in the end or accomplish something. Did you, was the thought in your mind how you're going to feel once you accomplish it? Or what if I fail and and I don't want to fail, I don't want to feel bad, so therefore I must be successful. Which one was stronger? What was your driver? Oh, the driver was definitely that I I cannot fail. Like that's like not an option. And I kind of was really hard on myself for for a lot of things, and I'm still hard on myself for a lot of uh, things uh, as well. And a lot of times I forget to be on my own side. That is also like a downside of how I am right now. 
Uh, and I think a lot of people are really hard on themselves because if you fail, it's not what's the worst that can happen. You're not going to die, right? It's not, nothing existentially bad is going to happen to you. This is what a lot of us always forget that fail, failure is a part of the learning process. And that's absolutely fine. But I think what, what I did not realize and what I think a lot of kids and like teenagers and a lot of you know, adults don't realize is that we've been brought up in a system where you're taught in school that if you make a mistake, you should be punished for that. Like you have like a lower grade, you're going to like fail this class and like all of that, you know, like if you think outside of the box, some of the teachers don't like it. They're, they're not going to be happy with that. And you're like, you know, making things up or just kind of having a different angle to things that you were supposed to. So I think that from a very early age, we're kind of, um, taught to like, you know, fit in into the, like the shape box that they think it's going to be where you belong. And then that's why people are like afraid to experiment and to, to, just to even fail. Also, like a lot of parents really punish their kids for failures and they just um, don't understand how to approach them differently. So I think it was, um, uh, it had like different factors. One was definitely the environment that kind of like um, teaches you that you should not fail because if you fail, then you're a loser uh, and you'll never succeed. Uh, and then and the other thing is also like that you develop self-doubt because of all of the factors. Um, so I think uh, all that combined really makes you feel anxious about going into the uncomfortable zone where it means that if you're comfortable, it means like you're not on top of it, which means that you will, you will fail because you don't know all of the things you're like not in control. And uh, that's also what's been like the worst nightmare for me as well. But honestly, every time that I, that I scaled or did something good in business was actually when I felt like I'm losing control and that I'm not um, comfortable with the decisions and I'm just kind of outside of my um, my field of expertise. And uh, this is literally when a lot of really good, happen good things yeah. uh, happen well, to me, both in life and in business. The, the, the thing is, I, you know, I, I'm hearing uh, you talk about this and you, you're so right except there's there's a difference between going outside your comfort zone and and failure being your driver so because oh yeah you, yeah they're completely two different things yeah 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 so you you are i mean it takes guts to go outside your comfort zone and then try things but even when you do that failure is not an option so Tell me if I'm wrong, but you know, I'm listening to your story and you are obviously a, a determined person. And as a kid, you always you know, did more and more. And the more you did, the more they gave you because you were able to deliver for people. So that gave you, so that's where, because I was thinking, how does a kid get so many responsibilities? Yeah, and, and I can see now how, because you always delivered. But the reason why you delivered, because you didn't want to fail. So that, yeah. that's, that's what drove you to take more responsibilities. And then, of course, as you delivered more and more, you kept, and then, of course, the more you took on, the more you didn't want to fail. So you, you're not, yeah. you know, people, people but say. But it is, yeah. but it is somehow connected because like, if you like, if they give you more responsibilities, you're not sure if you're going to do it. You're like, now I have to do it because I cannot fail. And you exactly. start doing something which is outside of your comfort zone. You're so afraid of the failure that you have to push through in order to succeed. So I think it's somewhat connected, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. It's, well, it must be exhausting emotionally. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of therapy now. <laughs> 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 it is yeah. exhausting it is exhausting when you just think about it like the energy and like emotionally yes. it's very very exhausting it is yeah i i hear you it's it's, it's tough well this this was great yana this is uh i mean i take my hat off to you for everything you've done and thank uh, you so much how far, yeah how far you've come so tell us uh, how can people reach you Give us your contact information. Yeah, so um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I really share some good content about e-commerce in general, but also international expansion. I, I do, I analyze a lot of brands, point out to their 
uh, weak spots, like what they could do to improve a lot of things. So it's really good if you follow me on LinkedIn. So that would be great. Also, you can follow our page on, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, we are always up to date with all of the Amazon international expansion um, content. And uh, if you have any listings that are underperforming, or if you're wondering if they're, you know, if they could be doing better, or, you know, just for you to understand if your product will be doing well in a different country or in your marketplace, feel free to reach out to us. We offer um, a, a report called AMOR, stands for Amazon Marketplace Opportunity Report. It's a manual report on 20 plus pages that will definitely help you realize if this is something that you should do or not, like what country to, to sell in next. And definitely if you have any questions about um, e-commerce, Shopify, Anything else, I'll be, I'll be happy to answer. I love to brainstorm about um, brands and you know how to how to uh, make them better. Great, thank you, Anna. This was one of the greatest episodes I've had. And learning about <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Nick, for having me. Thank you, my pleasure. And this brings us to the end of another episode, and I'll see you on the next one. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the episode, and share it with someone you think would benefit from it too.